All right, here we go. Uh, Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Chapter 11, The Fury. Some months earlier, just after the father received the new uniform, which meant that everyone had to call him Commandant, and just before Bruno had came home to find Maria packing up his things, father came home one evening in a state of great excitement, <clears throat> which was terribly unlike him, and marched into the living room where mother, Bruno, and Gretel were sitting reading their books. A Thursday night, he announced. If we've any plans for Thursday night, we have to cancel cancel. Well, you can change your plans if you want to, said Mother. <clears throat> but I've made arrangements to go to the theater with the Fury. Has something he wants to discuss with me, said Father, who was allowed to interrupt Mother even if no one else was. I just got a phone call this afternoon, and the only time he can make it is Thursday evening, and he's invited himself to dinner. Mother's eyes opened wide, and her mouth made the shape of a no. Bruno stared at her and wondered whether this was what he looked like when he was surprised about something. "'But you're not serious,' said Mother, growing a little pale. "'He's coming here to our house?' Father nodded. "'At seven o'clock,' he said. "'So we'd better think about something special for dinner.' <clears throat> "'Oh, my,' said Mother, her eyes moving back and forth quickly "'as she started to think of all the things that needed doing. "'Who's the Fury?' asked Bruno. "'You're pronouncing it wrong,' said Father, "'pronouncing it correctly for him. "'The Fury?' said Bruno again, "'trying to get it right, but failing again.' No, said Father. Oh, <clears throat> never mind. Well, who is he anyway? asked Bruno again. Father stared at him, astonished. Well, you know perfectly well who the Fury is, he said. I don't, said Bruno. Well, he runs the country, idiot, said Gretel, showing off as sisters tend to do. It was things like this that made her such a hopeless case. Don't you ever read the newspaper? Don't call your brother an idiot, please, said Mother. Can I call him stupid? I'd rather you didn't. Gretel sat down again, disappointed, but stuck her tongue out at Bruno nonetheless. "'Is he coming alone?' asked Mother. "'I forgot to ask,' said Father. "'But I presume he'll be bringing her with him.' "'Oh, my,' said Mother again, standing up and counting in her head the number of things she had to organize before Thursday, which was only two evenings away. The house would have to be cleaned from top to bottom, the windows washed, the dining room table stained and varnished, the food ordered, the maids' and butlers' uniforms washed and pressed, and the crockery and glasses polished until they sparkled. Somehow, despite the fact that the list seemed to grow longer and longer all the time, Mother managed to get everything finished on time, although she commented over and over again that the evening would be a greater success if some people helped out a little bit more around the house. An hour before the Fury was due to arrive, Gretel and Bruno were brought downstairs, where they received a rare invitation to his father's office. Gretel was wearing a white dress and knee socks, and her hair had been twisted into corkscrew curls. Bruno was wearing a pair of dark brown shorts, a plain white shirt, and a dark brown tie. He had a new pair of shoes for the occasion, and was very proud of them, even though they were too small for him and were pinching his feet and making it difficult for him to walk. All these preparations in fine clothes seemed a little extravagant, all the same, because Bruno and Gretel weren't even invited to dinner. They had eaten an hour earlier. Now, children, said Father, sitting behind his desk and looking from his son to his daughter and back again as they stood before him, you know that there is a very special evening ahead of us, don't you? They nodded. And that it is very important for my career that tonight goes well. They nodded again. There are a number of ground rules which need to be set down before we begin. The father was a big believer in ground rules. Whenever there was a special or important occasion in the house, more of them were created. But number one said father when the fury arrives you will stand in the hall quietly and prepare to meet him you do not speak until he speaks to you and then you reply in a clear tone enunciating each word precisely is that understood yes father mumbled bruno that's exactly the type of thing we don't want said father referring to the mumbling you open your mouth and speak like an adult the last thing we need is for either of you to start behaving like children if the Fury ignores you, then you do not say anything either, but look directly ahead and show him the respect and courtesy that such a great leader deserves. Of course, Father, said Gretel in a very clear voice. And when Mother and I are at dinner with the Fury, <clears throat> you are both to remain in your rooms very quietly. There is to be no running around, no sliding down banisters. And here he looked very deliberate, deliberately at Bruno. And no interrupting us. Is that understood? I don't want either of you causing chaos. Bruno and Gretel nodded, and Father stood up to indicate that this meeting was at an end. 
And then the ground rules are established, he said. Three quarters of an hour later, the doorbell rang, and the house erupted in excitement. Bruno and Gretel took their places, standing side by side by the staircase, and Mother waited beside them, wringing her hands together nervously. Father gave them all a quick glance and nodded, looking pleased by what he saw, then opened the door. Two people stood outside, outside a red old man and a taller woman. Father saluted them and ushered them inside, where Maria, her head bowed even lower than usual, took their coats, and the introductions were made. They spoke to Mother first, which gave Bruno an opportunity to stare at their guests and decide for himself whether they deserved all the fuss being made. The fury was far shorter than Father, <coughs> and not, Bruno supposed, quite as strong. He had dark hair, which was cut quite short, and a tiny mustache, so tiny, in fact, that Bruno wondered why he bothered with it at all, or whether he had simply forgotten a piece when he was shaving. The woman standing beside him, however, was quite the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. She had blonde hair and very red lips, and while the Fury spoke to Mother, she turned and looked at Bruno and smiled, making him go red with embarrassment. And, and these are my children, Fury, said Father, as Gretel and Bruno stepped forward. Gretel and Bruno. And which is which, the Fury said, which made everyone laugh except Bruno who thought it was perfect, perfectly obvious, which was hardly cause for a joke. The Fury stretched out his hand and shook theirs, and Gretel gave a careful, rehearsed curtsy. Bruno was delighted when it went wrong, and she almost fell over. "'What charming children,' said the beautiful blonde woman. "'How old are they, might I ask?' "'Well, I'm twelve, but he's only nine, said Gretel, looking at her brother with disdain. "'And I can speak French, too,' she added." which was not, strictly speaking, true, although she had learned a few phrases in school. Yes, but why would you want to? asked the Fury. <clears throat> this time no one laughed. Instead, they, unshift, they shifted uncomfortably from foot to foot, and Gretel stared at him, unsure whether he wanted an answer or not. The matter was resolved quickly, however, as the Fury, who was the rudest guest Bruno had ever witnessed, turned around and walked directly into the living room and promptly sat down at the head of the table in father's seat. Without another word, a little flustered, mother and father followed him inside, and mother gave instructions to Lars that he could start heating up the soup. Well, I can speak French, too, said the beautiful blonde woman, leaning down and smiling at the two children. She didn't seem to be as frightened of the fury as mother and father were. French is a beautiful language, and you are very clever to be learning it. Eva shouted to the fury from the other room, clicking his fingers as if she were some sort of puppy dog. The woman rolled her eyes and stood up slowly and turned around. I like your shoes, Bruno, but they look a little tight on you, she added with a smile. If they are, you should tell your mother before they cause you to injure yourself. They are a little tight, admitted Bruno. I don't normally wear my hair in curls, said Gretel, jealous of the attention that her brother was getting. But why not, asked the woman. It's so pretty that way. Eva, roared the fury for a second time, and now she started to walk away from both of them. It was lovely to meet you both, she said. Before stepping into the dining room and sitting down on the Fury's left-hand side, Gretel walked toward the stairs, but Bruno stayed rooted to the ground, watching the blonde woman until she caught his eye again and waved at him. Just as father appeared and closed the doors with a jerk of his head, from which Bruno understood that it was time to go to his room, to sit quietly, and not to make any noise, and certainly not to slide down any banisters. The Fury and Eva stayed for the best part of two hours, and neither Gretel nor Bruno were invited downstairs to say goodbye to them. Bruno watched them leave through his bedroom window and noticed that when they stepped towards their car, which was impressed to see had a chauffeur, the Fury did not open the door for his companion, but instead climbed in and started reading a newspaper while she said goodbye once again to Mother and thanked her for the lovely dinner. What a horrible man, thought Bruno. Later that night, Bruno overheard snippets of mother and father's conversation. Certain phrases drifted through the keyhole or under the door of father's office and up the staircase, and round the landing and under the door of Bruno's bedroom. Their voices were unusually loud, and Bruno could only make out a few fragments of them. To leave Berlin and for, and for such a place, mother was saying. No choice. At least not if we want to continue, said father. Well, as if it's the most natural thing in the world, and it's not. It's just not, said Mother. But what would happen is I would be taken away and treated like a, said Father. Expect them to grow up in a place like, said Mother. And, and then to the, I want to hear another on the subject, Father. 
that must have been the end of the conversation because because my father's office and then and then Bruno a couple of days later he came home from school to find Maria standing in his bedroom pulling all his belongings out of the wardrobe and packing them in four large wooden crates even the things he'd hidden at the back that belonged to him and were nobody else's business and that is where the story began all right so that is chapter 11 um, important things here in in this chapter i suppose the the fury who have, if you haven't figured it out by now is adolf hitler came to dinner with a woman named eva and uh, you can look her up in history and she was the mistress of adolf hitler and uh, father was offered a very important position at this mother's not very excited about it um, father says, though, that if he doesn't take it, you know, it's not going to work out very well. All right, so that was chapter 11.